Good morning. Um, thank you so much for being here. I know this is the end of the conference and you're probably starting to feel full from all the information that you've been getting. Um, you're in the session called Innovative Education and this is an incredible time in North Dakota with the uh, Senate Bill 2186 that was passed last spring. Now schools have more of an opportunity to be innovative in their schools. In the past, schools would look at the legislation law and they say, okay, here's the law, so here's what we're gonna do with our schools. With this new legislation, now you can look at what do we wanna do with our schools to help our kids progress, and then we'll worry about the barriers of the law. So very exciting. Um, on our panel today, we have um, Corey Steiner from Northern Cass. <laughs> We have um, Carmen Tubbs from Wapaton. Yay. Uh, Jackie Becker from Richland. And then we also have, uh, have um, somebody else who stepped in, um, Lene Lies from New Rockford Cheyenne. So, so thank you. Um, you will notice on the program, Cindy Erb Erbis was on there. She's from Richland, but something came up and she had to be in the school. But we have these four wonderful presenters. Um, these guys, we were fortunate enough to have Knowledge Works sponsor a trip to allow like 26 different North Dakota people go to Maine and visit an innovative district in Maine. Now, many times you might think when we go out of state and we go to a new district, it's this huge um, urban district that's very different from North Dakota, and it really wasn't that different. It was a district that had quite a few different schools, and we drove for miles and miles to get from one school building to the other. It was in a rural part of Maine, um, and they were doing some very innovative uh, things in their district. So this panel, um, these four people were fortunate enough to be some of those that were selected to go to Maine and visit. So what they're going to do is they're going to share a little bit about the Maine trip. They're also going to share some of the innovative things they're doing in their school district. So I will go ahead and give it to you, Corey. I'm not going to all of our time today, but I want to be able to share something that we're doing at Northern Cass. Driving nuts. All right. Something that we're going to do at we're doing at Northern Cass this year, and what we think is fairly innovative, uh, as we begin a, a three-year journey to move our district to complete customized learning. So let me say ahead of time, what is that going to look like? We are going to get rid of all grade levels. We will no longer have kindergarten, first grade, second grade. We won't have algebra run. Everything will be off levels. Uh, and in three years is ambitious. We've been told that, but we know if we say five years, then it's okay to do it in seven. So we said we're gonna do it in three, and if we do it in four, that'll even be better. So we will move to a customized approach pre-K-12. So kind of keep that in mind that this is our seed project to begin this work to figure out how to make this happen. Uh, this came about as we started to study customized learning last year, starting in September. We took about six full months of studying, taking visits down to Harrisburg, South Dakota, and Watertown, South Dakota, who have great models in place and doing a lot of reading, working with the Bush Foundation, uh, and then eventually going out to Maine to see what does it look like when this is done district-wide. Uh, and what we saw were students who own their learning, and probably more importantly, students who understood how they learned. Uh, kids that are the same as the students we have in North Dakota, but I will be honest, were significantly better prepared to walk out of their school <clears throat> and be choice ready. And so from that, we came back, we had this plan kind of in place, we revised, and so that is what our JAG Academy is. So I'm gonna take you through that, talk about what it looks like, uh, give you a chance to ask questions, and then our other panelists will talk too about what they're doing in their schools and what that trip looked like also. It's a requirement anytime I go out and present that I show this from our staff. Some people are like, Northern Cass, great, that's Central Cass. Central Cass is Castleton, we have some people here. Northern Cass is not. Uh, we're districts that used to be rivals, but actually work together quite well now. Uh, Northern Cass is a school district in and out in the middle of nowhere. If you haven't been there, we literally are in a cornfield. There is no community. There is no town. We are about eight miles from any town. Uh, so we are a really unique situation. 
So as a school district, one of the things we said is we don't have a mission statement, we don't have a vision statement. We got rid of all of that. We said it was jargon. I, I, everybody, if you believe in yours, I love it. And if you live by it, even better. But I can probably repeat something about 21st century skills, productive members of society. Everybody has the same thing. And that's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We decided we wanted something we could live by. And so what we did is we developed our collective commitments. These are for the adults. We're starting to work on it now with kids, but this is what the adults have to do every day in our building. If I have an issue with the staff member, if staff members have an issue with me, it comes directly back to this. And we talk about this at every single staff meeting we have, we start with an activity around, how did you meet the commitments last month? Where do you have to go to improve? If you want your district to believe in something and live by something, you put it front and center every single time you get up and talk to them. You will not have a meeting. Our parent advisory board doesn't get to do anything the first 10 minutes except talk about this. So, but that would be one thing I would encourage you to do is find out what you stand for and then make it part of what you do, okay? The next thing we did is we developed this. And you can say it's a vision statement, maybe it is, but we developed our why. Uh, if you've ever read the book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why, it's a great book to try to explain like, why do you, he says it, why do you get out of bed in the morning? And more importantly, why should anyone care that you get out of bed in the morning? And so we challenged our teachers to say that. Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Well, you know, I gotta pay the bills. That's a what? Well, I, I, I wanna go teach. That's a what? Why in the world do you get out of bed? And why should anyone care? And we came to this, that we believe every kid can change the world, therefore it's our job to provide a world-class education. Now you might look at that and say, that's lots of jargon, and there is. So we have went back and we broke it down and said, what does that mean to change the world? What does it mean to have a world-class education? And we define those things in our school district. And I will tell you this, we're not there yet. I would say we're probably at about 75% of our people that really look at a kid when they walk in and said, that kid has the potential to change the world. We still have people that look and say, that kid is gonna change the world in a really bad way. And we have to flip that script. So we are constantly working on climate and culture things to look at kids, not as if that's the choice they make to misbehave. I believe every kid is the best version of themselves. And if there's some junk that gets into the way of them doing that as a school district, we've got to find a way to fix that or figure that out. Really tough, really hard to do. But if we can get this, everybody would love coming into our building in the day. And I'm going to say something, you're not going to like to hear it. The teaching part is easy when everybody wants to be in your room. When parents wanna walk through the front door, parent meetings are really easy. This job doesn't have to be that hard if we can get people to love walking through our front doors. And that's really what we try to do. So you have to understand that background because it's allowed us to do some things quicker, I think, than some other districts because we do have a really strong climate and culture. So this is, and I'll throw it all up there, but what I want you to understand is this is our strategic plan goal. Uh, and DPI came with this and we had had this last year that we want everyone to graduate choice ready. And we, we beat DPI a little bit on that one. We had this because we had been working kind of closely with them. Uh, so it's choice ready. Notice for ours, you'll see college, job, and military. With DPI, you'll see college, career, and military. We came to the conclusion in our district, there's not an 18 year old in the world that understands what career means, nor are they ready for a career. If I can get a kid to get out of bed in the morning, to take directions, to follow through, that's job ready. And so we, we've kind of changed that because we felt it was a little bit intimidating to our kids and to our parents. So those are the next points. If you really want your kids to be choice ready, I'm gonna tell you this, the model you're using right now in your schools is not working. Now, does that mean we're not teaching well? No. Uh, I don't know if Ted Dinnersmith said it yesterday, but Ted Dinnersmith says he thinks he's pretty sure we have the greatest group of educators in the country. I firmly believe that. I have been to Atlanta, I've been to Maine, I've been all over this country at schools. I have yet to see someone who is as gifted as who we have in the classrooms. So this isn't an issue about not working hard. It's not an issue about not having the talent. This is all about our paradigm, our model. It's not working and it's not working pre-K-12. And I believe this next one wholeheartedly. If you care about a kid, wouldn't we start meeting kids where they're at? Instead of saying, today, I'm an old social studies guy. 
And if I could tell teachers what not to do, I would have them follow my career the first five years I taught. From giving zeros to getting on kids to not nurturing, all the things that I could do wrong, I can look at and say I did every one of them. So if I looked at it, I always used to say, we're going to learn about the Constitution today. Why? Because that's what's in my lesson plan, and I said so. It didn't matter whether half the kids weren't ready for that. It didn't matter if half the kids already knew all about that. That's what you're learning, and you're going to do it for the new ne next two weeks because I know better. And we have to get past that. We have to give up some control. We have to start meeting kids where they're at. So here's what we noticed in our school district. And I, I want you to say, do you see any of these things in yours? Do your kids get into college? Yes. We, we have a little bit, probably more of an issue on some of our reservation schools. And, that, and that's an, a different kind of beast that we have to work on as a state together. But for the most part in our areas, our kids get into college. Here's what our problem was. They're not getting out on time. They're coming out with this massive amount of debt, okay? Some debt is okay. I, I think it's all right for a kid to go to college and have a little debt to pay back. That's my own personal opinion. My kids do not love that idea, but they will learn to live with that idea, okay? They're going to college, they're going for three years in a major area, and then they're saying, I don't know if I want to do that. Then they go out, they finish college, and they'll get in the workforce and they say, I don't think I want to do this. Okay, now we're not talking about a little bit of debt that's manageable. We're talking about a massive amount of debt that's going to affect quality of life. And it does affect their quality of life down the road. So undecided on the PowerPoint. This drives me nuts. How many of you have a senior PowerPoint that your kids put up there at graduation? A lot of you probably do. And what happens on there is going to NDSU, going to UND, going to Concordia, and you love it. And then all of a sudden you get to about three kids and it's like, not sure. Not sure, undecided. It makes me cringe because for 13 years we have had these kids and we've helped them. And I say help, told them what to do, how to do it. And we get there after 13 years and they don't have a clue what they're going to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this different for you. Maybe it isn't that they don't need to know what to do. Maybe we start to have to have kids experiences where they know what they don't want to do. I want you to think about that. What if we started preparing kids in a way that they had so many experiences they knew for a fact what they didn't want to do? Because that's what we were talking about. And we're talking about it with this. We have this girl, we put her in a job shadow. Job shadows could be really wonderful if we did them the right way. The right way means you don't put a kid in a job shadow for four hours because any job looks great at four hours. You want to be a superintendent? I can give you four hours of just beautiful, beautiful things that you can do. Some of you are like, oh, that was the greatest day ever. So a kid comes in, they're like, I want to do that job. And they weren't there for the other 174 days. We can make any job look great. We have to make job shadows long-term things. You can't do that if a kid has to be in class for seven hours a day. You can if you change the model where they don't have to be in class for seven hours a day. So this girl went in and she did a little two-hour block with an architect. And she got done with it and came back, how was it? She goes, I really want to be an architect, got to do buildings and do all this cool stuff. And she goes, this guy's been working on the same project for three years. He doesn't really do anything. I don't want to be an architect. Two hours it took for that young lady to figure out, I don't want to be an architect. And we wouldn't have got that if she went to push for the job shadow. So we put her with a social worker. This young lady comes from an extremely at-risk family. Really, truly one of the saddest situations that I've worked with during my career. Sat down with the social worker and she said she got done with that and she came in. She goes, I'm going to make sure no kids ever have to go what I went through. I want to be a social worker. We could do that for kids if we shift the way we approach education. See, she, she knew I don't want to be an architect. Three years of college, she would have went in before she probably realized that. So think about that from that perspective. This is the problem. Our system right now is based on what's good for us and not for kids. We all say it. Everybody in here says, we, we do what's right for kids. We're student preference. We're not. Again, and it's not that we don't love kids. We do. But the decisions we're making right now are based on what's best for the adults. Why don't we innovate? Because it's uncomfortable for us. We went to a departmentalized model in third grade, thanks to Anna, Sal, and Oaks saying, do this, Corey, it just makes sense. And our parents were freaked out. They can't go from room to room during the day. They're not capable of doing that. 
We said, I think they are. And it took about mm, 30 minutes the first day and the kids had it just like that. All the parents just worked up, struggled like crazy. Kids have no problem. Kids adapt. We have to give them credit and we have to have high expectations for them. So through this whole process on us getting ready to innovate, we did not just do this. We had meetings, we had conversations. So we met with every seventh and eighth grade parent. We gave it a choice. Do you want to come to this meeting? We had 55 people show up. Actually, sorry, we had 70 people show up. 55 parents and 15 kids come to our meeting. What do they call that in North Dakota in January and February? Basketball. <laughs> you don't get parents to come in, correct? Maybe fall conferences, not spring conferences. We had all these parents come in. We talked to the students, had focus group meetings, like, could we customize? Do you want to go at your own pace? Could we try something different, not give you grades and go off like a proficiency model? And all the feedback we got from everybody is, try it. Parents were a little less skeptical. What do you think high school parents were worried about right away when we told them your kids aren't going to have grades? GPA and scholarships. You got it right away. So my kid won't have a GPA, can't get into NDSU. Not true. We talked to Mayville State. Right away, we talked to NDSU, we talked to Valley City State. They're like, I guess we'll have to look at your transcripts differently. Because what we told them is, we're gonna give you the transcript and you're gonna deny a kid with the 28 on the ACT. Colleges need to make money. They're not gonna start denying your kids because you send a different looking transcript. In Maine, those kids didn't have GPAs like that. It was every kid in their school district had at least a 3.0. And they were going to Harvard and Yale and having great success. We met with our secondary staff and we said, if you're interested and you want to do this, you can sign a commitment statement. If you don't, you don't have to. They all signed. We met with our board, we presented it. They made a motion to proceed with presenting a proposal to DPI. So we came about with the Jaguar Academy. So here's what it is and I'll throw it all up there. And okay, it's a seed project. Uh, when I worked as the data steward, we had seed projects throughout the state. We don't call it a pilot. Pilot projects go away when funding goes away. If you sit there and say, hey, we're gonna pilot something in our school, I understand why your teachers will say, I'm just gonna wait a little bit and this too shall pass. If you throw a seed in the ground and you water and foster it, it grows and it maintains on its own. We're building a program to sustain itself. Don't call it a pilot project. Students chose to come into the academy, 34 last year, two that joined this year. Pure choice. Now, we had an application process. They had to get a letter of recommendation because we wanted them to prove they really wanted this. Somebody asked me, who did you deny? Early, we had a team that went through this and we had half or three quarters of the team that said, we're denying this kid, this kid, and this kid. And I had to step in and say, we will deny no kid. Well, why do we have an application process? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, to be honest, I was like, oh, I guess now you made a good point. Because if we're gonna make them apply, why deny? but you can't deny a kid this opportunity. Because I know you're probably thinking, well, they have to be enriched. The kids in here, some are, some are not. Some are just the average everyday student you'd see. Some are at-risk kids. Any kid, that was the key for us. Because if you want fair and equitable, you give every kid an opportunity to do it. You can't limit. That's really important. So what kids did is they picked three or four core courses. And they are in our academy room. The academy room is the flexible seating dream for any teacher. There's a couple tables, there are bean bags, there are soft seating, there's places to put your feet up, there's places to lay down. Uh, if, that, if you want to do this and you want to do it in a traditional, there's desks in the room, don't do it. It has to have a different feel for it. You will walk into our room and lene has been there, it has a different feel than a regular traditional classroom. So what we did is they have four courses. They take three in there, they can take all four. They get to figure out what they want to take outside. They flex out so they can go be in electives. The part that's beautiful is our eighth graders are in high school elective courses if they choose. So I have a lot of kids that say, I love foods, I want to cook. Why wouldn't I put them in discovering foods? So then they can take the next level of foods as a freshman and take even more. And eventually go be a call in culinary at NDSCS. I have one kid who's like, I really love science. I'd like to go into anatomy, but I'm only an eighth grader. Go take anatomy. So we have kids that are in anatomy in eighth grade and we wrote that into our proposal to say, weigh that requirement. I've never understood, and this is not a DPI thing that's involved, this is tradition throughout the country. Why is it that kids are only smart enough to take algebra one for high school credit? That makes no sense. That is a flawed system. 
So we have all kinds of these eighth grade students that are taking high school courses throughout. Why? Because they're able to explore their passion now. I have a kid who's like, I'm gonna be a physical therapist. I love PE. All right, take more PE, I don't care. So he's in a high school PE course. And then he said, one kid came and goes, I don't wanna be with like ninth grade and 10th grade. I just wanna be around my friends in eighth grade. Okay, he's taking eighth grade electives that our other kids are taking. Their choice. They build it, it's their schedule. So they have basically the option of anything that doesn't have a prereq. They're not taking AP Calc because they have some stuff they've gotta get there before. But we do have some eighth graders taking AP Human Geography. That's a cool thing. And they're doing quite well in it. So they work at their own pace. This is the part people struggle with and our parents struggle with this. I don't care what they work on. So I have kids right now that have not started English this year. And they're like, oh, how can you do that? They have to be in English for 50 minutes a day. I, I don't care. They love science. I have a girl right now, she is 78% done with her eighth grade science course. She will be starting biology in the next two weeks because she has mastered eighth grade science. She was supposed to spend 36 weeks in that course. We can't even trick her to get things wrong. But she hasn't started English. I'm not worried about it. They have a pace that they have to keep. They have a schedule they have to keep, but it is all at their own pace. I have one kid who's like, I'm just doing world history. I'm gonna finish world history, then I'll do English, then I'll do algebra. Okay, at the end of the year, you know where you have to be at. So kids in that room are all at different paces working on different courses. That was a lot of anxiety. And their parents struggle mightily with it. And kids got kicked early on this. Because what they saw that is, is ah, I don't have to work on anything because I can just catch up later. Nope, that's called overtime, people. And so they come after school, before school, and summer school if they don't meet their benchmarks. Okay, uh, What's it going to allow for? Here's our... our long-term look is that these kids are going to get through some things quicker and maybe not but if i have a kid three hours a day that can work independently i can put them in a job shadow for three hours a day and they're not missing school time that's a cool thing i can put them in an internship their senior year if they go a little faster i've said i don't want seniors on our campus anymore they should be out in internships let them go in internships for a half a year let them come for some dual credit and ap stuff at our course why are we, why they don't need to be there we're trying to prepare them for the real world, but we're just keeping them really, really set in their ways. Let's get them out there. That's our goal. We hired a college and career counselor, an additional counselor. Despite having some financial issues like everybody else in this room, we hired a full-time person to say, your job is to be out of the building 50% of the time and put kids in job shadows, internships, and apprenticeships. And we made that a requirement. So that's where we went with that. Uh, and then I told you about the elective. Okay, it's all proficiency-based grading. I will tell you we don't have, this isn't perfect by any stretch, but it's getting there. So these kids do not have a 90%, an 85%. They hate it. Okay, be prepared for it. And mom and dads don't like it either. And I just met with a parent the other day and they said, okay, but they're, they're a 4.0 student and now they have a three. Correct. But, you know, they're gonna apply for the scholarship and they're not gonna be able to get it. Incorrect. And yes, you won't take them. Incorrect. And so we had to kind of really work with them to help them understand that a 3.0, a 3 means you're mastered it, you're proficient at it. And so our scale is one's the beginning. That's the stuff when a kid's never been exposed. Okay. A 2 is really foundational concepts. They need to know it to be able to move on. So it's heavy in vocab. I'm going to be honest with you, and please don't take this the wrong way. Those are mundane. Those are things that can be delivered online as far as I'm concerned. I don't know that we have to have a teacher teaching vocab every single time we have new vocab words. Does it help for them to reinforce? Absolutely. So we tell our teachers a lot of this, find a way to deliver that online. Find a way to deliver that in a model that allows kids to be a little more independent. Level three is where they get. So our kids right now on the standards, not in a world history course, but on the standards that make up world history are having to get to a three in each of those standards before they're allowed to move on. Now, how do they get to a three? They can take a test. That's one. What we found quickly is we said 85% was our threshold and we had kids getting an 82% and they would walk up to the teacher and say, but I know this, this, and this. And we'd say, oh, okay, yeah, you're a three. So kids can come up and explain why they're a three. 
they do one pagers. We have a one pager that they have to put information on that can demonstrate on that standard how there are three. They'll sometimes come up and say, I'd like to do a presentation to my classmates and teach the class. Okay. Kids get to help have some say on how they become a three. Now, when we say a four, it's a lot on there. I'll give you the short end of it. A level four is a choice a student makes. Every kid, our, our commitment in our district is every kid gets to a three. The commitment the student parents have to make is if they want to get to a four. You want to be a 4.0 student? You can be, if you choose. We saw it in Maine. We saw a lady's transcript. She was a 3.0 after her freshman year, and she said, Ugh, I need to be a 4.0 student. I have to try a little harder. So we now have level four projects. And in those level four projects, kids will propose a project which can meet the standards at each level. I just got an email from one today. She's like, I want to do a level four project for geometry. I'm going to go into Argusville, and I'm going to, my friends and I are going to tape and record the angles that make up nature. And then we are going to present how geometry is used in nature. And they're going to do that for their science standard and their geometry standard. Somebody asked, well, who gave them that idea? They did. I had a kid come in the other day and he goes, I want to do something that meets all three of my standards. I love D-Day. Okay. So he's going to do a, a research paper on D-Day. Not what I would have chose, but he's like, I love it. He goes, I'm going to get my writing standard. I'm going to get my social study standard. And then he said, but I want to get science. So I want to study the tides and I want to look at the tides and how they affected World War II and how people could attack at certain times depending on the tide. As an eighth grade student, I could have, I, I don't tell him this, but there's no way in the world I would have ever thought of something like that. <laughs> Is that what we want for our kids? Own it. Decide it. So now he's working on it. So when he has free time in the day, he's working on it. His mom emailed me. She goes, yeah, the other day on Saturday, he's like, I was going to go with his friends, but he wanted to work on his level four project. We had one of our kids call the other day, and mom said, can they work on this over the summer? Yeah, absolutely. We're getting kids to start to own it. Is it, is it all rainbows and unicorns? No. Are some kids struggling like crazy? They are way behind some of these kids because they've not figured out yet when you own your own learning, you build your own schedule, you have to set all that. So how's it look like? And I won't have a whole lot more, so I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time. We have a lead learning facilitator in there. So we have a person that runs the academy. They're not in there all day because they're a special ed strategist, which was a perfect fit for us because special ed's been doing customized learning forever. Somebody asked, does MTSS go away? No, MTSS is customized learning. None of that goes away. So all the good things you're already doing just fit perfectly with this. And so that Mrs. Utes is the lead learning facilitator in there. She is the one that runs the academy. Her and I meet every single week. We debrief, we go through things, we write question and answers. Uh, really wonderful. A core teacher is assigned for each hour of the day. They are an academic advisor. Every kid is given an academic advisor. They are to go to that person when they're struggling, when they have questions, when they need things unlocked in their online platform, or when they're gonna prepare for level four projects. And it's about seven kids per person. Uh, that has been a really key piece. If I could go back, I would have front loaded that better. We didn't do a good job of preparing our academic advisors for their role. We made a mistake on that. And so we're, we're having to play some catch up on that. Uh, like I said, not this is not perfect. We're adjusting constantly. Seminars are huge. Here's the one thing people are going to say in your district. Well, if you do something like this, there's no direct instruction. And people are going to start asking, what are your teachers doing? They're just sitting around. They will say that. Be prepared because we've heard that. I had a parent the other day. Well, so they just sit in a classroom and do nothing all day? Yes, that's exactly what's happening. No, it's not what's happening. So seminars. In our JAG Academy, every single week kids have to attend seminars. So what they do is they take those content, those complex topics that you know ahead of time because you're the professional they'll struggle with. And they have breakout sessions with small groups where they're doing direct instruction with kids. But now the part that's beautiful about that, that we're getting to, we've had part of it happen, is if you three are ready for the Constitution and you two are ready for the Articles of Confederation, we're doing a seminar with you three and we're doing a different seminar over here. So kids now are able to pick the seminar they go to based on where they are at in their courses. The seminars are huge because our teachers who are really resistant said, I love talking with kids. I love book studies with kids. They still do that. We have kids, they get choice of books. So instead of saying you're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, we might give them 10 books about social justice. 
and they'll read that, they still do book studies. They still do the exact same work that they're doing in the classroom, they're just doing that in a customized and personalized manner. And it's really worked well. Uh, kids every week have to send an email to their parents. They have to say, here's how I did last week, here's my goal, they have to write a SMART goal and say, here's what I will accomplish this week. And that's really kind of a beautiful thing because one, parents have to respond. What is the one thing everybody would like to hear from our parents? Be involved in our kids' education. Parents have to respond. Or your kid might not be in the program. So parents respond, great job, I'm so proud of you. Why didn't you get there? Last week we had a lot of this. Ah, it was homecoming week and I didn't work really hard. Okay, that happens. Anybody ever have those days at work? I do, where it's like maybe it wasn't I didn't work hard, I didn't want very productive. These kids can have that. They're human. But now it's like, what are you going to do this week to catch up? Well, I'm going to work on Wednesday night when I don't have church, and I'm going to work two hours on the weekend. We're hearing kids say that they'll put that in their goals. Again, it's not the model. It's what kids are starting to do with it, the ownership that they're taking. This is a key piece. you got to develop standard operating procedures. Please don't call them rules. Rules are what you tell kids, and then you get a little feedback on so you may say, we need a rule on respect. Well, we need to respect each other. Okay, I got student feedback on rules. Well, let's be honest, you really didn't. And that's okay, because I mean, some of the things you have to tell kids, like, no, you can't punch your friend. Even though you guys want to punch your friend, you can't punch your friend, that's a rule. But standard operating procedures operate on the idea of what's really going on here, what's the problem? So what we said is, here's some of ours. Our kids have freedom. They want to go to the bathroom, guess what they do? They go to the bathroom. They don't come up and ask. We told them that, and they would struggle with that. Like, may I go to the bathroom? Yes, don't go. I, I mean, dead serious, how many of your kids do that? And we're like, you need to tell me when you're going to the bathroom. I get it for some kids, like, yeah, they're gonna wander and they're gonna go 500 times a day, but, but why? Like, I'm not, they're gonna get into college and I'm not gonna tell them that. And so let them have that choice. So we said, they'll come up there, they'll go put a click down and they walk out and they go to the bathroom. And then here's what we saw, they get breaks because they might be in there for three hours a day. It's ridiculous to think they can work for three straight hours a day. And so they get breaks. What we found is breaks became five minutes, then they were 10, then they were 20, and they were wandering the building. So what we looked at is, what's, why are they doing that? And we said, well, because they can. Okay, well, why can they? Well, because we didn't put a rule in. Well, what rule? And we asked ourselves that why five times. That's kind of our rule. And then we look with the kids and say, we need a procedure. And the kids sit down and they work through what the procedure is. So the kids decided we will get five minute breaks twice a day. We will take a stopwatch with us. We will start the stopwatch when we walk out the door and we will make sure we're back in and we will stop it in and we'll show you. If we go over our five minutes, we will make that time up after school. Now, who did I tell you made that up? The kids. If I tell them that, they're mad. The kids did it. Having problems with cell phones because we gave them free reign. And people cringe at that too. It's like, oh, kids are on Snapchat during the day. Okay, better be appropriate. And I go in the room and kids are on their phones. You guys are on your phone. Yeah, I was working for the last hour and a half. Okay, might need a break. We do it. So I'm like, okay. So now we found out they're on their phone for 20, 25 minutes. We say, what are we gonna do? All right, well, we're gonna come in and we're gonna put our, our phone in a pocket when they come in the door. So they come in, they put their phones in pockets. And then what they do is they check their phones out. And they check their phones out a couple times a day. Again, who developed that rule? Kids. It's really tough for a kid to come say, that's a stupid rule. Your buddies are the ones that made this rule up with you. Standard operating procedures are really key if you're gonna customize and personalize the learning. Uh, we've got, if you go to our website and you look at the JAG Academy, uh, our teacher there has a blog. We do PLCs with our JAG Academy staff, so we're constantly having the conversation. We use data, so we always see where kids are at every week, and we're using that data every single week. So kids every week come up and sit down with Mrs. Utes, they go through their data, they set their goal, they report out their data. So when we're talking using data, this is real time, in the moment data. What do you think about anxiety? You're gonna find out that these kids, a lot of them that are in their play school very well. You tell them to turn it in and they turn it in. You tell them there's a test and they cram the night before and they're ready for that test. They're gonna have anxiety because you're not gonna be able to give them answers. You can't solve their problem. We have had to sit there with them and say, I don't know, what do you think? Well, just tell me the answer. I don't have the answer, what do you think? And you have to be prepared and it's a little bit painful because what, everybody in this room, what do you all do? Try to help a kid, you just wanna help. 
but you have to step back a little bit. Uh, grades, I've kind of explained in independence. We have one kid who is at about 8% done in all of his classes. He's supposed to be at about 45, 50%. And he just, he works at a slow pace. And so the conversation was, your independence is getting you in trouble. And so what can you do different? So he put a plan in place. He worked with his parents. Now he's got time every single night. He's got overtime, just like a job. He's working overtime to try to get caught up. It's a valuable lesson to learn what happens when you get behind. Because right now our kids don't know that. What do we do? I'll give you a couple more days. Oh, when you miss work, when we miss school, we'll give you the same amount of days to make it up. I get that. I understand it. We don't get that in the real world. If you say, well, I was gone for three days because I was sick and your things to do Thursday, guess what? Do Thursday. And our kids are finally starting to learn that. I said, who? Some intrinsic motivation. Some of our kids don't have it and they've been just fine. But you want to know, you want to ask that to kids like, you know, do, you, do you care? If you don't care about your learning, this is not right for you. You have to care a little bit about what you're doing. How to set goals, here's what I'm gonna tell you about that. Any kid in the world can be taught how to set goals. You have to teach them. We said set your goals, so what did we get the first week? I will do better next week. <sighs> and I mean, we just cringe. Like, no, 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 okay. Uh, I will get more percent done. <sighs> no, so it took us about four weeks before we finally got good SMART goals. And then when we looked at it, whose fault was that? Ours, we didn't teach it to them. Be intentional, teach them what you want them to do. Self-reflection, when they're doing online stuff, they are required to take Cornell notes. We do it district-wide Cornell notes across the board. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but they are taking notes. Now what we have found is they write down every single thing on every slide. So now we are doing note-taking seminars for our kids and we realize we need to do it for every kid. So we're trying to get them to understand what information you pull up. Think about college, that's a skill. Think about a PD thing. I hope you're not writing everything down. Not everything I have to say is gonna have any bearing on what you do. Hopefully there's certain things you pull out. That's a skill we have to teach kids. Uh, advocate. If they don't know how to talk to an adult, and we've had that, well, they don't like to talk to an adult. I don't know what to tell you. I had a third grade parent come in the other day. Well, they're, they're afraid to talk to an adult. And I just said very nicely, you better figure that one out. Like you as a parent better figure out what to do with that because that will not let them be successful in life. Not just when they're 30, but now. CTE education, electives, anything they're passionate about, they finally have a chance to do it. And then I said, it's, it's key if we're intentional, and this is an important part too. So we develop, it's from Ed Leader, a profile of a graduate. What skills do we want our kids to come out with? I, I went and met with some of the college and I said, what's a Northern Cass graduate have? And no one could tell me. Well, they, what they did is say, you have great, respectful kids. Awesome, what are their skills? I don't really know. And so we said, well, maybe it's because we're not really telling them or teaching them the skills. So we developed eight skills that we wanted. I don't know if these are right. If you want the four C's, put the four C's on there. It doesn't matter. But what we decided is all of these kids are gonna come out with that. And we're going to assess that at second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, and their senior year with a capstone project. So yes, right now as we're talking, I have teachers, a group of 10 teachers, I believe, sitting in our conference room, developing the rubrics, developing the scales for proficiency for our capstone project. To graduate as a senior, you have to present to a community panel and demonstrate evidence that you have gotten those skills. To go to third grade as a second grader, you will have to demonstrate you have those skills. And we're gonna be very purposeful about that. We believe that's vital. This is called learner agency and customized learning. It has to be done. This is the first thing we're really doing in terms of the movement district wide. Uh, we went to the Ron Clark Academy. Ron Clark, pretty amazing, like, oh, crazy. And you might say, oh, it was just for show. Nope, that guy walks on tables during his teaching. Uh, I'm not saying that everything he does is right, but I will tell you that you have to approach your classroom differently if you're gonna customize it. And that is like this ridiculous enthusiasm. Just ridiculous enthusiasm. Uh, you gotta, if you saw some things and some of the things he said, we did it instantly. We, can, we went and traveled there, we came back, we implemented some of his things instantly. The results have been things I've never dreamed could be. All of our third graders have to talk when they speak. Stan, sorry, they talk when they speak. Well, they, they do talk when they speak. Uh, uh, sorry, all of our third graders have to stand when they speak. 
Every time, doesn't make a difference, unless they're given permission to blurt. And our teachers will go, time to blurt. The kids will go, time to blurt, two plus two, and now the kids know they can blurt out answers. They all stand. They have to track the speaker. They don't track the speaker, they get in trouble for that, and they go write their name on the board. And you might say, oh, I can't believe that. It's not about the punishment, it's about the reflection when I go up there. So we have third graders that are leaning slant, lean forward, and they're tracking the speaker. It's wonderful. They have to bring their materials to class. If they don't, put their name on. I mean, it's just these simple little things that every kid has, every teacher is doing, that's leading us to customized learning. These are all pieces that we found out after we started this journey we had to have. So what are we gonna do? And I can just show you this quick. Uh, year of training, we have Marzano come in. If, if you're interested in customized learning, there's a book by Marzano, Doug Finn, F-I-N-N, the third. It is a Marzano, a research-based strategy for seven steps to implement customized learning. It's exactly what we saw in Maine. Doug Finn is the person who did this in Maine. He helped build their model. He helped build it, the Lindsay Unified School District, which was a school district of 98% free and reduced and 99% EL, and they are completely district-wide customized learning. They changed their model when they had 15 high schools and 13 of their 15 valedictorians in their district had to go take remedial classes in college. Their very best students weren't making it in college. In that whole district. So there's a book called Beyond Reform. It's a short read that, again, if you're interested in this, there's a book called Inevitable. If you don't read, if you read any of them, Inevitable is the first one. That's the one that will give you information on how this looks. So we have Marzano coming. They came in August. They'll come back for two days in November, present to our whole staff, and then we'll work with individual teachers on beginning this work. Ty is coming in January or January to develop our progressions of learning because no longer it is a first grade possession to second. It is what's the standard, what's the next standard all the way up. By the end of this year, we'll have all of our progressions built. Our expectation is basically next year, math will be completely customized pre-K through. The next year we'll be reading and in our third full year, everything will be customized. And it's ambitious and we know it, we've been told that, but we're going to do it. And we know that next year is going to be brutal. They told us be prepared. And they've also said after you get through year one, you will never want to go back. Everybody in Maine said that same thing. There's no way in the world I'm going back. None. And I'm going to stop there because I don't want to take other people's time to talk, but they'll be around for questions. I'm not going to tell you it's right or wrong. I'm going to tell you it was our first way to dip our feet in the water. The results so far have been really, really positive. Kids are going faster, kids are going slower. Kids set their own schedule, kids decide when they work on things, kids are owning their own learning. We now will send out those 36 kids on the first job shadow in about three weeks. All 36 for a full day in job shadows, which we have never been able to do with the kid in our district for full days. That's where we're at. hate speaking after he just got done. But one thing he did not mention is Dr. Steiner is a fabulous leader and a key piece of what's happening in their school, as is Melissa Utes. Melissa Utes. And he did not also mention how engaged the kids are. When we, a few of us wanted to go see what this looks like, we went down there and got to visit with the kids a little bit. and. Um, one's laid out on the futon, and I'm like, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, I'm on my brain break. I've been working for, I don't know what the, there's some restrictions, like if you work so long, then you, you are allowed a brain break and whatnot. But the kids took fabulous notes, and I'm like, how do you get your kids to take notes like that? I mean, they, what they're doing is fantastic. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold. <clears throat> on the other hand, I think what we in New Rockford Cheyenne are doing is fantastic as well. It's not quite at that level by far, but we are doing what I would say beautiful things, mostly with our reading as of right now. Um, the three gals in the front are my team, and I call them my team, We're <laughs> teach with me. And um, we decided to start on a smaller scale just with our grades one through three, for, no, K through three, or K through six, I'm sorry. Um, I just found out last night I was doing this, so I'm scrambling this morning to write a few little things down, so sorry. Um, 
what our reading is personalized. We use the Scholastic Guided Reading Program. We use um, Lexia Core 5, Le Lexia, um, they were one of the vendors. And we also, um, our superintendent applied for a grant, got it for some type of an online reading program that was personalized. I had a few quick minutes to find one because it was due like at four o'clock that day. And what I came across was Mayan. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But um, mostly what we're doing is what I would refer to as station rotations somewhat. And it, it, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic thing. I think it's beautiful. And I've said a number of times, I wish everybody could get the chance that I get to walk around and see what it really looks like. Um, Natalie Becker's our elementary principal, and one day she's walking around taking pictures. And later on in the day, somebody said, why is she taking pictures of us? And I said, because it, this is beautiful. She is so proud. I have nothing to do with it, and I'd like to say I am so proud. I'm the Title I coordinator. But I, I am so proud of what I see going on, and our kids are loving it. Our, L, our LD kids are doing very, very well. Um, everybody feels good. Everybody's feeling success where they're at. I just think of last year in a classroom I was in, um, a little boy got his reading test back and it had a big red 64 on it and, and the teacher had written, do you want to retake this? I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, why would he want to retake it? He couldn't read it the first time. Why is he going to want to do it a second time? He, you know, It's just so different this year and it, I think our kids feel good. Wouldn't you guys say that? Um, I wish I had. I wish I would have known I was doing this because I would have had some pictures so you could see what it looks like. But the kid, while well, our classrooms are flexible seating, um, the kids kind of veg out, do what you know. We kind of went too far right away, and then we had to rein it back in because we decided, oh, this isn't quite what we want. Um, definitely a learning curve with what we're doing. Um, oh, yep, yep, good. Hang on, I got to find my place in my scratchy notes here. Um, Natalie, it was a big priority for her to make sure the staff had collaboration time this year. So every day, the staff had the, uh, the teams, they're broken up into teams, have one hour to get together every day. Um, I think for the most part now, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the staff, the teams are getting together. And while the way that happened was we, we formed a tech class art class, music, and PE. And between all of this, it's allowed the, the kids to rotate throughout these extracurricular activities. And then it allows the teachers time to get together, go over their data, what's working, what's not working. Um, you guys should be up here. <laughs> Strategies for strugglers and whatnot, yeah. Um, I, wa I did want to say a few uh, things that I saw in Maine that I thought was um, powerful. One big thing that they had mentioned is they want to cultivate hope in all their learners. Um, they want their kids to know the future will be better than the present, and I have the power to make it so. And that kind of goes back to some of what you you know in, in your school. You want to give the kids, you want them to take over their education and their learning. Um, that the grade level should not determine the curriculum that they're in, and. I, I think, uh, I, I mean, how scary, but how powerful. It, it really shouldn't. Why does that matter? Um, another thing that I wrote down is they really want their kids to start to wonder. I wonder. I wonder. Instead of having, instead of having knowers, they want their kids to be thinkers. You know, And I always say the world doesn't care what you know anymore, but what can you do with what you know? Um, Another thing I wanted to add about New Rockford, this is another key piece that we are adding to our day. Um, we're, at, we're adding an end of the day exploration hour, and our students um, have a choice in what they want to participate in. Real quickly, their options were to choose from a book and drama club, engineering and robotics, art class, science sleuths, dance club, music mania, tech time, DIY, and community connections, and they signed up for what interested them. We don't quite know what it's going to look like, um, but we are starting soon. And the kids get a voice and choice in it, 
for that hour. And I can honestly tell you so many times the kids are now saying, I can't believe how fast the day went. And the teachers are saying it too. Where did the day go? Holy cow, it's two o'clock. Um, I would say in closing, sorry ladies, our school has a much, our elementary has a much better feeling than it, than it once had. And I don't know, I, I just think it's beautiful. I'm proud of what we're doing. It's not near what you guys have going on over there, but we're gonna get there. I always say we're riding Dr. Steiner's coattails and he doesn't know it. <laughs> but um, did I miss anything? Oh, yep. School-wide Title I this year, that helped a lot, so. <coughs> school-wide coordinator. So during reading class, every student gets to meet with the teacher every single day in a small group. There's no more than four to six kids in a group. And those kids have said, I've asked them, what's the best part about your day? And they say, I get to have a long time with my teacher. We don't do that when we're teaching whole group and girls' desks. And um, kids are leaving reading and they're happy. They're late. They don't want to get off their computer when they're reading a book that's at their level. So we have a third grade class where we have a 10th grade reader and a first grade reader. And when they're on their computer, when the teacher's meeting with the small groups, they're reading a book at their level. I don't care if they're reading the dog, you know, chase the whatever, and there's a kid reading Harry Potter or a larger than like book. That's where they're at. And so they're happy. And then Lene has time where she's looking at all the data, and then we do interventions with kids throughout the day. It's just my sixth grade teacher, I'm going to put him on the spot, said, Natalie, I didn't think this was going to work. I, this really freaked me out. Everybody was freaked out, right, girls? You were all freaked out. Like, how's this going to go? Because we did this in January, and we started in August. And I said to my superintendent in January, August is tomorrow. We're not ready for this, but we are. We're doing it. Um, and he said to me, the sixth grade teacher, this is magical. I, I didn't think this was going to work, but I now feel better equipped for what my students didn't know and what they need to know than I ever did before. And he's been in this job for almost 30 years. So that was incredible. And, and teachers are smiling. Kids are happy. And parents are asking the question, Dr. Steiner, what about grades? So it's definitely a growth mindset for us, and we've been in this profession. It's a growth mindset now for the students, and it's going to be a huge shift in mindset for parents. But it, I truly believe this is what it is. The technology is their world. It is not going away. It's only going to get to be more. And just like you said the other day, if you're a writer, you got to make a choice. you got to be a runner. And, and our students are doing that. Our teachers are doing that. I've got a great team. I couldn't do this without them, and they are they are what's making this work. So, um, one other quote from one of the teachers was, um, he said, you know, in the past we always just kept teaching reading, and we just we just kept going, and we thought they were getting it, and now I see they weren't getting it, and now we know what we know where they're at, what they need, and it just. I, I know I'm not a very good speaker, so I know I'm not doing a very good job of this, but I just think what we are doing now with the use of Lexia, Myon, and the Scholastic Guided Reading Program, um, it, it is a fantastic system. The kids are, are the, the, I mean, the, you can see the gains. They can see the gains. They themselves are progress monitoring. They can see on their own charts how well they are doing. Um, oh, I had one more thing. I forgot it. But anyways, one more little thing. Um, I also said, told our, our superintendent that I think everyone in our school needs to go to Northern Cass and see what they are doing. And Dr. Steiner probably doesn't like this, but I think everybody should go see what they're doing because <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And, it, and when you see it in action, it's, it's beautiful. So anything else? <clears throat> Well, I teach high school math, so I wanted to go on the main trip because wouldn't it be nice if everybody who came to Algebra 1 was proficient, which is not the case. Um, so I really enjoyed the trip. Um, that's where we're here to talk about that briefly. Um, the students were engaged, which was nice, and they were taking ownership in their learning. And um, so I had to take away that part because my school is not doing anything with proficiency-based education right now. Um, so I'll just say a really briefly what we are focusing on. We're focusing on project-based learning. And we started out, um, our administration and the teachers were really excited, so we showed most likely to succeed. 
Then we had three parent forums and just let them ask us questions like, are you still going to have grades? Yes, we're still going to have grades. Are you going to do content? Yes, we're still going to do content. So um, that's what our focus on is project-based learning. We're starting out um, baby steps. So this year, every teacher has to do at least one project. And if you don't know anything about project-based, it's like a regular project, but you add in some things like you have to have an authentic um, it makes a tie in with the real world. You have to have an outside audience. That outside audience can be your just another class. It can be parents. It can be businessmen. Um, so we are starting out with that. Um, some teachers are doing more than that. Um, like I said, I teach high school math. So me, it's hard to use the project to teach the upper level concepts. So I'm trying to take some of my other projects and turn them into project based. Like last year, I had a local lady come in and show us how to do um, stained glass overlay. And then they had to use just straight lines when we were done with linear equations. So I'm just trying to do that kind of thing in my classroom. Um, and we are going to have an exhibition at sometime in the spring where kids can pick one of their projects and then the parents come in and look at those. So that's where we're at right now. We're hoping to get more so that people maybe do two a, sem uh, two a year, one each semester. But we're starting out with baby steps. So that's where we're at at Richland. OK, I'll wrap up here because I know we're getting short on time. Um, oh, I would say the biggest thing, you know, my takeaway from Maine, um, in Wapaton, we're at the beginning stages of kind of innovation um, in education. And Maine was the start of that. Um, we also sent a group down to Harrisburg, South Dakota um, this year already and plan to um, get some feedback of, you know, when's our next group going and, and um, to move forward. However, what I, the biggest thing um, I wanted to convey today is that it's a different way of thinking. This is not one hour of the day. This is not, um, you know, a, a, a project that you do. It's, it's a different way of thinking if you want to go big. So starting with the why, like Mr. Steiner talked about, um, is big. And I think that's kind of where we're at now. Let's talk about the why. Why do we need to change? This is the future of education, and it's going to have bumps in the road because it's new. Innovation means new. So there's not one path that you have to take. In Maine, it looks different than it looked in Harrisburg, than it looked at the, in the JAG Academy. It's going to look different everywhere. Don't get caught up on the logistics. Start. Start somewhere. Send a group somewhere. Start a book study and get that vision, ambitious, right, like Northern Cass, or if you need to start with whatever, where that you're at with your school, but start somewhere, because it's the future of education and, and we know we need to move that way. So when you think about that traditional way of thinking where we're all on the same pace and we're all doing things at the same time. When we went to Harrisburg, they had a student panel and that was one of the things, um, one of the fourth graders, which they don't call him a fourth grader, there, but um, it, one of the fourth graders had shared was that's how we used to do things, is that I always had to do the same thing at the same time as everyone else. And now I work at my own pace. And he was honest about, you know, in the, in the beginning it was difficult to manage time, it's difficult to, to do some of those things, um, but don't we have kids behind pace now? Don't we have kids that are, have difficulty managing pace now? I don't understand how, that, how that's different and why that should be a roadblock to move forward. Um, and one of the staff members there said, they have difficulty managing their time because we do everything for them. We tell them when to eat. We tell them what to eat. We tell them when to go to the bathroom. Not only asking us, we tell them when they go, right? You're going now at 930 because this is our bathroom break. So why would they ever figure out how to manage their own time? We're, we're spoon feeding them that. Um, and we need to give them more credit. So I think that's the biggest thing is to start somewhere. Don't get stuck on the logistics. Don't get stuck if you know you don't have enough technology, you don't have the right furniture. Yeah, I get all of that. Those things need to be figured out, but they will get figured out if your bigger vision of why you want to do this and why you feel like there needs to be a change is in place. So start there if you don't know where to start. Start in your classroom if you don't know where to start. I'm thankful to be in a district where I have staff that's always willing to do next steps. They're, they're always willing to take on the next challenge and, and to take on something new. And I have great, um, you know, backing from administration and from, from my team and from my superintendent that's willing to look at new things and, and move in the right direction. So you're here, you wanted to know more about it, that's your first step, you're starting. So don't let that get in the way and, um, you know, keep pushing forward because that's the future and that's what our kids deserve and it's um, what you deserve as professionals. So that was the biggest takeaway I wanted to bring.
I, I want to thank all you guys for, for your work. And Lene did step in at the last minute because Jill Lauder was going to do it and it wasn't prepared. Um, thank you to Jackie and Carmen and Corey. Um, just a quick thought is um, Carmen really summed it up. It's different in every school. So you're not going to look at like Corey's school and go, that's what we want to put in place. It's not a program that you go check off the list. This is what we're going to do. It's what do you want to do? Do it differently for you and what works. Um, another thing is that with the Senate Bill uh, 2186, you do need to um, do a proposal to DPI and have it approved. Corey was the first one to put in a proposal and get approved. So you can see that their school is far ahead of some of the other schools that are working through this. Um, when the, the administrative rules are just being worked out, they are, um, there's been a hearing on it, the Attorney General is reviewing it, and then it goes to Legislative Council to get approved. We're hoping that they'll be finalized by February 1st, maybe before, if we're lucky. And then you will see an application come out. Um, and so you can watch for that. And we do have the proposed administrative rules online already, if you want to check them out. Um, email me if you want more information on where to find them or, or um, uh, what's on them. Um, and then I really wanted to point out too that this is a planning process. It's not one that you're going to, to go, oh, here's something we want to do, let's just put it in place. Within the administrative rules and with this application, you need about a year planning. So it's not something you're just going to pick up and your school is going to run with. Corey's school has been doing that planning for a very long time. He didn't get into that a whole lot, but I can tell you his school and his community have been doing that. Because um, normally DPI would have not approved it this quickly, but we knew all the hard work he'd done in the past. Um, so I wanted to let you know that. And then maybe one other thing is that this is, um, we're going to be looking for data. If you're going to be doing innovation in your school, DPI has to report to the legislation to say, here's what schools are doing. Here's the um, statutes we're waiving. Here's the results we're getting. So when you're working through this, think about what you're going to measure and what you want to change in your school and the why. So um, with that, I'll let you go. If you have questions, you know, just ask.